test, 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 test.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Within Church this morning. So happy you had the opportunity to worship today. Uh, it's the fourth Sunday of Lent. We've been going through this, dip, this, uh, this, this series called Rethinking Religion. And today we focus on, we get to rethink the solution to our sin. We rejoice that Jesus has completely destroyed Satan and he gives us that victory through faith. So that'll be your focus for today. We'll begin this morning with the opening hymn, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary. Let's worship the Lord. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether a symbol of murder. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your love of love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you for all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. Now may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. Our first lesson this morning from Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 to 9. This also serves as our sermon text today. 
They travel from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of God. Our next hymn, the choir will introduce the whole, the whole hymn, and the congregation can feel free jumping in on verses 2 and 3 in the refrain.
Our second lesson from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Here the Apostle Paul gives us a wonderful reminder that faith is the hand that receives this gracious gift of God of eternal life. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that, in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God. Please stand for the gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson is taken from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, save, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have, been, what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. This time we invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Good to see y'all this morning. All right, if you like getting presents, raise your hand. Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> presents are fun, aren't they? What's the best present you've ever received? What do you think, Faith? A makeup set. Nice. Jill? PS5. PS5. Oh, yeah, for sure. Paul, what do you think? Connect Four. Connect Four is pretty good. We play that a lot in our house. What do you think? Video games, yeah. I remember when I was young, I, we got the Nintendo Entertainment System, Duck Hunt. Oh, that was so much fun. What do you think, Decky? Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's fun to get presents. And the best thing about a present is what? You didn't work for it. You don't deserve it. It's just a gift given to you. It's not because you did your chores. Not any of that. It's just a gift that somebody gives to you out of love. You've done nothing for it. Well, you have even a greater gift than a PS5. Right? Or Nintendo, you have the greatest gift of all is the gift of eternal life. And God just gives it to us. And it's not wrapped up like a present with a bow. Right? He gives you that gift of life by looking to the cross and seeing just how much your Savior loves you. He loved you so much that he went to the cross and died for all your sins so he could give you the gift of eternal life where you have amazing blessings for the rest of eternity. Right? 
This is what God gives you. So he encourages us today as we go through life, as we go through struggles and sicknesses, all these things, to drop everything else, stop clinging to ourselves, and look up to Jesus and the cross and live. Let's pray about that. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all the blessings you give us every single day. We're so thankful for the gift of eternal life you gave us in your son, Jesus. Please be with us. Help us to always look to him and live. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 570, God loved the world so that he gave. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for our consideration, taken from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Allow me to reread verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. This is the word of our God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Last Wednesday night, I had the privilege of preaching at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Shakopee, one of our sister con congregations. But I also wanted to have fellowship with you all, and I wanted to enjoy the great chili and the sandwiches with you. So after catechism class, I walked in the gym and tried to greet as many of you as I possibly could and sat down to enjoy some excellent chili and sandwiches. I knew I wanted to be at Mount Olive like 15 minutes before the service, make sure the microphone is all set. 
Um, make sure I don't forget my stole, which I realized I did this morning. All these different things to make sure that everything is ready for this worship service. I look at the GPS and it says all is clear. Plenty of time to get there and have this great meal. So I'm having, having this meal, talking with little Bennett. He's giving me cookies. <laughs> then it's time to go. So I get up, start the truck, and it actually starts. Turn on some good tunes and drive down the road to Shakopee and all is well. Until I hit downtown Shakopee and then I see the train gates go down. <laughs> and it's no big deal. I've hit that train a thousand times and they're usually pretty short. Well, apparently not on Wednesday night. <laughs> the longest train in the history of the world. And I'm looking down and I think I see the caboose coming, but no, it's never coming. The longest train ever. And then not only is it the longest train ever, it actually goes down and goes to almost a complete stop right in front of me. So here I am, looking at the clock, starting to get a little bit nervous, looking at the world's longest and slowest train, and then that feeling inside of me starts to build up, that feeling of impatience. And it's funny how impatience wells up inside of us, uh, in, a, in, a, in us, isn't it? It, you can feel it in your fingers and your toes. You can feel it as you start to shift in your seat a little bit. You do all these things to try to distract you. Turn the radio station. But at that moment, there's never, ever a good song on, is there? <laughs> and you see it in other people, too. I'm looking in the rearview mirror. I see the guy behind me looking out the window, <laughs> trying to see how long this train is. One other person honks his horn and backs up and tries to turn around and go a different way. There's no other way to cross the railroad track. Uh, people get impatient. If they have to wait just a little bit, a couple minutes for a train. That's nothing compared to what they went through. They're at the end of a 40-year journey. 40 years. A whole generation of them died in that wilderness. And now they're on the threshold of finally entering this promised land that they had been waiting for for years. And they get there, and the only thing stopping them, the only thing between them and the promised land, was their distant cousins, the Edomites. Descendants of Esau. Well, there was no welcome hog and yeah, come on in. Instead, they were met with an army that said, no, you can't go through here. You have to go all the way around us. So you have to go back again to go around Edom. And they felt impatient. Not the kind of impatience you feel when you're sitting at a stoplight or in traffic or, or waiting for a train. The kind of impatience where you're at the end of a 40-year journey and your own family makes you go around. Impatience does what it does, and it grows. Listen to verses 4 and 5 again. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. That familiar feeling that we've all had is welling up inside of them. They're shifting their feet. They're feeling it in their fingers. They start to get a little bit hot as this impatience boils up and it grows. And their impatience, like ours, at times turns to frustration. So they get frustrated with Moses. They get frustrated with God. Somebody has to take the blame for this. This is not going as they had planned. They had already thought about how they're going to throw that tent away and get rid of it and build this amazing home in the promised land. They had been thinking about the crops they would plant, and they can't wait to wake up every day in the same place. They were thinking about the flocks that they would raise, all these different things. They were on the threshold of this promised land. Now they're told to go around, and they're frustrated. And their frustration turns into grumblings and complaints. Now remember, this is a generation that never actually lived in Egypt. They weren't slaves. Their parents were. They heard about this from their parents, and they talk, as they're talking to Moses, one of the only handful of few people left that actually lived in Egypt, they glorified how great Egypt was as slaves, as if it was like Disney World or something like that. They romanticized the past while they complained about the present situation. They said, we don't have any water, Moses. What are you talking about? God gave you water from a rock not once but twice. No bread. God rained down bread from heaven every single day. He even flavored it for them with some honey. They grumbled. They were frustrated. They were impatient. And they complained. Our impatience grows too. I'm not just, sitting about, I'm not just talking about sitting in a, in a traffic jam somewhere. We get impatient that sometimes God's timetable is not ours. 
Maybe you think of your education and how it just seems to take forever to get through, through, through school. You think of your career and things didn't ha ha pan out the way that you thought they would. You think of your family life and how you wish you were closer, you wish you had a bigger family, all these different things. And sometimes all of our best efforts, our best plans aren't what we think they should be. So we get impatient, we get frustrated, we complain, we grumble, we grumble about anything and everything. And we also, like Israelites, oftentimes romanticize the past. This is how I remember it, and we always constantly complain about the present. All the blessings God gives us and surrounds us with every single day, at times we just take those for granted. We complain about those. And we let that well up inside of us as we let those things stew in us. Yeah, I think we know how these people feel. I think we've acted like they've acted. Impatience, frustration, complaining. But I think it goes deeper than that. We recognize that God is God and we are not. We like to be the ones that are in control of our own lives. We like the, the, to be the ones that make the plans. And we like, the one, we like to be the ones that have control of that and make it all work out our way. So when things don't happen that way, we get crotchety. Not just with our plans that are broken, but the fact that God didn't allow that to happen. We want to set ourselves up on our own thrones. We want to be completely self-reliant and need nothing from anyone or anything else. So when things go away, we get mad that God is God and we are not at times. Faith can't live in that situation. That will always bring spiritual death. So God, in this lesson, brings death so that he can bring them life. Listen to what he says, verse 6. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So one moment, you're on, the, you're on the brink of finally entering the promised land, all that you had waited your entire life for. And then you're turning around and going the opposite direction. And the uh, impatience, the frustration, the grumbling, the complaint starts to build up. And then the very next moment, all that's gone when you're bit by a venomous snake. As you feel this running through your veins, none of that matters anymore. The house you're going to build, the crops you're going to plant, right? None of that matters anymore. And you forget about the impatience, the frustration, the anger. And all you do is want to run and look up and live. This is what God does for them. God had to shatter their self-reliance. He had to get them to stop counting on their own efforts, their own works, and their own plans, and get them to trust in him and him alone. He had to do that, not for his own ego, but for their good. Because we can't have eternal life depending on ourselves. So he shatters that for them by allowing these snakes to, snakes to come. And think about how he answers Moses' prayer. Think about how he answers that. He doesn't take the snakes away like he could have. He doesn't send anti-venom down from the skies with the manna, which he could do too. Instead, he says what? Moses, take a, make a brown snake, put it on a pole. And anybody that looks at that, they'll live. So simple. Purposefully ridiculous. So that they stop relying on themselves. It's not their effort. It's not their ingenuity. It's trusting what God says. Trusting what God says that he will do what he says he will do. Anybody who looks at that snake will live. This is how it still is in our day, is it not? In our whole Christian life. God has to shatter my self-reliance. He has to shatter our self-reliance um, with failures, with tragedy, with sicknesses, with all these things. These are the venomous snakes that bite us to get us to realize that we cannot do this. We need a Savior to save us from this. That was always right around the corner for them, whether they were in the promised land or in the wilderness, whether it was a snake or something else, right? This is why God allows these things to happen, to get us to stop trusting ourselves, not to look at a bronze snake, but to look up at a different cross, God's only begotten son. And think of how simple that is, purposely simple. God's only begotten son goes to a cross for you, an instrument of torture, so that we look up at it and live. And there on that cross, 
All of our guilt is removed. There on that cross, all of your sins are completely washed away. There on that cross, God gives you his greatest gift, the gift of eternal life. God's face shines down on you with his love. And we see the God who is above us in every way, shape, and form, how he is intimately involved in me and your life by giving us this great gift. So we look up and live. It is purposely simple. So we stop relying on ourselves and trust that God does what he says he's going to do. This is why you bring your kids to the baptismal font. You trust that God always does what he's going to do. It's just ordinary water in a normal bowl applied to the baby with a simple pastor. But God does what he promises. And when that's connected with God's word, he brings that little child into God's family. Gives them the forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. Gives them a home in heaven that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Gives them eternal life. This is all given to them. It is simple. Almost ridiculous for that reason. We stop relying on ourselves and trust in God and look up and live. We come up to the altar and we, we eat bread and wine and we trust that God says that as we eat this bread and wine, he's giving us his very body and blood. The same body and blood that was nailed to the cross for all of our sins. And through that, he washes all of our sins away. Through that, he empowers us to live this new life. It is purposely simple. So we stop relying on ourselves and look up and live and see how great and wonderful our God is. This is the gift of eternal life that he gives us. I'm 42 years old. I can't imagine being on a journey for 40 years and being told to turn around. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the impatience. I've never been bitten by a poisonous snake, but I've been close a couple times. In a lot of ways, this whole lesson seems so foreign to us, doesn't it? But it is our life's journey, is it not? We have that sin running through our veins, the sin that the Bible tells us will always result in death. And God allows things to happen to us so that we stop relying on ourselves, trust him, trust his word, and look up and live. God's blessings as we do that. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with the Apostles' Creed found on page 8. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Congregation may be seated for the offering. At this time, please take a moment to fill up the friendship cards in the pews ahead.
We'll continue on page nine with a response to prayer of the church. Please stand. <coughs> o Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are, mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing in your world. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil service who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our business and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Eternal God, your love endures forever. With mercy and might, you have sustained Lee and Barb Grayler with blessing upon blessing, as I now give you thanks for 51 years of marriage. You've been the source of the strength they have enjoyed and the spring of the faithfulness they have shared. As they rely on you for every good thing, we ask that you continue to go with them as their God and Lord, preserve their faith by your word, consecrate their hearts to your service and to each other, and lead them forth in your peace. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. We join the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the next hymn. Again, the choir will introduce this new hymn. The congregation is invited to sing verses 3 and 4 in the refrain.
We'll continue on page 11 with prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. You may remain seated for the closing hymn, hymn 519, There is a Redeemer. <laughs>